back towards the end of World War II, when our servicemen were returning from home from Japan, uh, they brought along with them grand stories of wild nights spent with geisha girls, and I'll leave what they were doing to your imagination. However, the servicemen were really referring to cafe girls or licensed prostitutes who used the geisha name to make a buck. Because of this, geisha were now confused with prostitutes, a misconception that still haunts them to this day. So I'm going to reveal the secret life of a geisha, the facts and characteristics that many people are unaware of when it comes to them. Some of you may have heard of this book, or maybe you saw the movie. Six years ago, I first read it, and then several years later, I saw the movie when it came out. And although I really enjoyed the book, it is fiction, and it led me to seek out the truth of a geisha. Today, I'm going to reveal to you what the real job and purpose of a geisha is, the different levels of training a young woman must go through to become one, and also the significance of their clothing and makeup. So if a geisha is not a prostitute, then what are they? The word geisha literally translates to art person or person of the arts, with uh, gay meaning art and sha meaning person. And that is just what they are. A geisha is a traditional Japanese entertainer. According to Caroline Zinko, who authored a report called True Geisha for the San Francisco Chronicle, Geisha date back about 400 years ago to the Edo period when Japan was at peace and developing entertainment quarters with restaurants and tea houses. The training Geisha received then is still the same it is today. Geisha are extensively trained in Japanese dance, singing, playing the shimisen, wearing kimono, and Japanese tea ceremony. Here you can see a picture of the shimisen. It is a three-string banjo-like instrument that is strummed with a large pick that you can see here. You can see a picture of a geisha posing with one there. And geisha are hired to attend parties and gatherings, traditionally at tea houses or traditional Japanese restaurants and entertainment quarters to perform, dance, sing, play the shimisen, and serve tea. And here you can see a picture of a performance done by two geisha dance performance. You can see another picture of a performance. There's um, a woman playing the shimisen and another geisha dancing to it. And here you can see a picture of a geisha preparing to serve some tea. And geisha live in Okiya, which is like a boarding house for geisha and geisha trainees. Right here you can see a picture of the entrance to an Okiya in Kyoto. And the name of each working geisha living inside the Okiya is written on these wooden plaques right here. And Japan's most popular geisha districts are called Hanamachi, and they're located in Kyoto and Tokyo. The tea houses, inns, and restaurants where geisha entertain are concentrated in these areas. And here you can see a map of Japan. You can see Tokyo and Kyoto, and these are the different Hanamachi, and you can see how they literally surround the cities. And so now that you know what geisha are, I'm going to explain to you how you become one. And to become a geisha, young girls must go through a three-stage process that lasts many years. In fact, according to a National Geographic article on geisha, training to become one <coughs> takes about as long as it takes to become a doctor. And today, young women choose to become a geisha much like they would choose to become a doctor. Historically, however, it is said that girls from poorer backgrounds were sold by their families to the Okiya. The first stage of the training process is called shikomi. They typically begin their training after junior high school at the age of 15. All geishas start out at this phase when they arrive at the Okiya. Their role is essentially as a housemaid, and the work that they are given is difficult with the intent to make or break the new girls. This stage lasts about one year. The next stage is called Maiko. Maiko are apprentice geisha who follow around their senior geisha mentor, who is called an Onesan, and her Onesan will train her the proper ways of serving tea, playing shimisen, and dancing, pretty much being a geisha. And Essentially, Maiko observes the behavior of their experienced geisha to learn the arts she can't learn in school. And around the age of 20, after a period as long as five years, the Maiko is promoted to the last and final stage of full-fledged geisha. Once you are a geisha, you remain as such until you retire. Common reasons for retiring include marriage, because you can't be a geisha married at the same time, and exploring other careers. And although geisha remain as such until they retire, their appearance changes throughout their career. During the shikomi stage of training, these young girls rarely leave the house other than to go to school. They wear simple, informal kimono and no makeup. Right here you can see a picture of a shikomi. You can see she has no makeup on. Her kimono, to me, looks like a curtain and is pretty drabby. 
And uh, on the other hand, the traditional makeup of the apprentice geisha, myco, is one of their most recognizable characteristics. Here's a picture of two myco. And as you can see, their face features a thick white base. And this uh, white makeup was once made with lead and was poisonous. But due to health concerns, it's now made out of rice powder and is harmless. And they also have bright red lipstick with red and black accents around the eyes and eyebrows. First year Myco will only color in the bottom lip red, as you can see in this picture. And this makes her easily recognized as the first year Myco. During this time, her own song will help her to apply her makeup, which is a long and extensive process, as you can see from the amount of brushes and makeup in this picture. And after one year of experience, the full round of seasons, she paints both lips red and is supposed to look more sophisticated, which you can see in this picture. And Michael wear a highly colorful kimono with long extravagant obi, which is essentially a belt. Here's a picture of a Maiko and her really colorful kimono, the bright green. You can see a little bit of the obi, but you can see a better picture here. It's very long and extravagant. And um, in this picture, you can see the special wooden cloth worn by the Maiko, which is called the Okobo. And once the Maiko is promoted to geisha, her look is mellowed down a lot. The older geisha will still apply the white makeup, but usually only for special dances that require her to do so. And as you can see in this picture, the face is very natural looking with little to no makeup. The kimono and obi are also reflective of the subdued style of the older geisha. The patterns and styles are less flamboyant and the obi is much smaller than the micro. As you can see in this picture, the kimono is not very extravagant, not very colorful. The obi is small. This is also another good picture to show you. It's not very colorful, very small. And um, in this picture, you can see the flat fold sandal that the geisha wear outside, and that is called Zori. And you can also see what they wear inside, in the little toe sock equivalent, and that's called Tabby. And as you've learned, the word geisha itself literally means art person, and it is as performers of dance, music, and Japanese culture that they actually spend most of their working time. They are not prostitutes, but entertainers who go through a rigorous training process to become such. Those training processes and customs developed back in the Edo period are the same traditions that are still held on to today. From the girlish, heavily made up Maiko to the more unexciting appearance of the older established geisha, the dress and makeup is used as a way to distinguish what stage of training the women are in. Now that I have revealed to you what the secret life of the geisha is, I hope that I have cleared up any misconceptions that you may have had about them. Gesundheit. All right, JP, what did you think? Um, I think it was structured really well. She had a lot of information. Um, she had a lot of visual items she could use. She kind of just went right along the post board, which was nice. It just went down one side. Then see the other side, and then down that side again, and it made it really easy to see it. Um, she spoke a little fast, so just a little, and uh, it made it hard when she would say all the names to the different items that they'd wear, and then like try and keep up with it all. But all in all, I think information-wise, she did great. Okay. Yeah, I I'd agree. Most of the technical stuff on the speech part is uh, fine. I thought the introduction was really good and clear. You, you've got a personal justification that you give. I think you give a little bit more background information. We talked about this a bit, maybe some more information about uh, contemporary uh, situations. Uh, your definitions are clear. They're easy to follow. I thought that, especially in the first half of the speech, that you had some good citations. Uh, a little bit less consistent later on in the speech about citing that information, so that's a a bit of a problem. The explanations are fine. You're, you're getting a lot in the speech, so uh, I understand that you're going quickly, but I do agree that it's a little bit of a distraction. Um, the uh, and, and some of the things could be a little bit more interesting if there was a, a story or an illustration to go along with them. We got lots of definitions and quick descriptions and then we're on uh, to the next thing. And I, I think uh, context is what draws us in a little bit more rather than just data. And sometimes I got the feeling that I'm getting way more data than I am context. Let me stop this.